Dead America, The Second Month, Seattle Rebuild, Part 1, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1, Seattle Rebuild, Day 2. The sun was barely over the horizon as Clint Rensfold and Corporal Gad drove slowly away from the airfield, where Captain Kersey and his men were about to take off, fresh from their briefing about the mission to Idaho. Clint ran a hand through his white hair, despite only being in his forties. He'd seen enough serving under General Stevens that there wasn't a dark hair left on his head. Despite being discharged, of course in the apocalypse there was no rest for anyone, and he'd become one of the general's top trusted men in the field. The corporal shifted in the passenger seat as he flipped open a folder of papers, sifting through it. Gad had been assigned to work with Clint, and though he was a lot younger in his late twenties, he had a good head on his shoulders, and understood the gravitas of everything they were trying to do. Seattle was chaotic, but a relaxed and relieved kind of chaos. The invasion of the city had been a success, with a safe zone completely carved out, stretching from the water to eight blocks in every direction. The further one went away from that, there was still danger with buildings full of zombies. While the doors were secured, it was still taking a lot of manpower to watch over them, ensuring that no ghouls would break free and wreak havoc on everything they'd built so far. Even with this threat, however, the duo were relaxed knowing that the majority of the fighting was behind them. It was a new start, a new project, a rebuild instead of a battle. It was nice to see the streets crawling with people, military and civilian alike. So, where are we off to next? Clint asked brightly, reaching down into his cup holder and raising a fresh cup of coffee to his lips, taking a sip and then setting it back down. He slammed on the brakes as a few children rushed into the road, nearly spilling his brew. A woman rushed out and grabbed them, waving an apology as she dragged them back to the sidewalk. Clint waved mockingly, giving the woman a giant fake smile. Yeah, get a leash if you can't get them trained, he muttered under his breath as he continued to wave and grin. Gad blinked, looking up from his paperwork. Get a leash? he asked, shaking his head. You can't be serious. I'm very serious, Clint snapped, finally taking a sip of his coffee and replacing it to the cup holder before he began driving again. They just survived a month in the zombie apocalypse. Imagine biting it because you got run over by a car. Hell, with as scarce as gases, you might be the last person in the history of our great nation to be roadkill. The corporal shook his head again, looking back to his paperwork. Remind me again why you're here, he asked with a sigh. We have plenty of military folks. Not sure why we're bringing in rejects. Clint slammed on the brakes again, turning to glare at his passenger. The corporal withered under his gaze, his eyes widening in terror. The older man licked his lips slowly, staring Gad dead in the eyes. Let's get something very clear, corporal, he said, his voice level but menacing and no nonsense. You call me a reject, or any derogatory variation of it, one more time, and I will stop whatever I'm doing to whoop your ass. Not only that, but before said ass-whooping begins, I'm going to whistle very loudly to get as many people in the area to come over and watch as I rip you a new one. He reached up and hooked a finger into the collar of his shirt, pulling it down to reveal a massive scar along his chest and upper arm. IED nearly took my arm clean off, he explained as Gad's mouth opened and closed like a fish. Spent eighteen weeks in the hospital, and another eighteen months before I fully regained use of it. I was in hell before that IED went off, and you can damn sure believe I went through a different kind of hell after. He let go of his shirt and cocked his head. By contrast, let's look at what you've done. I glanced at your file when General Stevens asked me to help with this assignment, and the closest you ever got to seeing combat was playing video games with the neighborhood kids on the weekends, since you never made it further than Central Command. So you may not like that you're assigned to me, but it's a fact of life. 
You don't have to like me, but you're going to show some goddamn respect when you put my name in your mouth. He raised his chin. Understood? Gad's voice squeaked instead of coming out coherently, and he snapped his mouth shut, swallowing hard. Finally, he took a deep breath and nodded before finally finding his words. Clint, I'm... I would like to... Clint scoffed and waved him off. Save your apology. We're cool, he drawled, turning back to the steering wheel. The last month has been a little rough. You ain't kidding, the corporal agreed, letting out a deep breath of relief. Especially rough for me, Clint continued as he put the vehicle in gear. It killed me to be on the sidelines for the assault, after spending so many years being on the front lines. About a week ago, I was finally able to catch up with General Stevens. Luckily for me, the man has a nose for talent and putting people in the right place. So you're friends with the general? Gad asked, his voice taking on a more conversational tone, despite the edge of fear still there. Clint nodded. Spent several years working ops for him, he explained. Post-injury? I moved into logistics for a multinational firm supplying the military. Even coordinated some runs for him. He was happy to have me back in the fold. The corporal nodded thoughtfully. Okay, I'll buy that, he said slowly, and then straightened his shoulders, finding his confidence. But level with me. You actually good at what you do? Or were you just blowing smoke because you wanted to feel useful again? Clint growled, but paused to chew over the question. He finally nodded, because the question was as fair as it was offensive. I was five years into my career when all this hit, he said. By the end, I was coordinating product movement between 65 sites in 12 countries, each with their own challenges as well as their own convoluted laws and regulations. Had a team of 12 who worked directly under me, coordinating a whole mess of other details. We were a well-oiled machine that got shit done. Gad nodded again, tapping a pencil on his papers. Well, this is going to be a lot different than multinational product movements, he said slowly. But it is good to know you can handle a lot of moving parts, because we have an ungodly number of them to deal with. Well, the good news is, if Captain Kersey is as good as General Stevens says he is, we should have the ammunition situation squared away, Clint said as they continued their drive. Gad sighed. Only five hundred other things to check off and we'll be good, he muttered. The older man couldn't help but chuckle. So, what is next to check off? he asked. Gad finally found his assignment sheet, scanning it for a moment. Head due west to the Cascade neighborhood, he instructed. It's on this side of the interstate. Need to do a front-line supply check. Clint glanced over, his eyebrows hitting his hairline at the sight of easily forty things on that list, just on the front page. Guessing we're going to have to make this quick? he asked dryly. Probably for the best if we want to get through this initial list sometime this week, the corporal retorted. All right, let's do it, Clint replied. The drive was a short one, about fifteen blocks to the target area. As they left the downtown safe zone, the number of soldiers became fewer and fewer. Instead of dozens, there were only a few at each intersection, with teams of two walking up and down the streets. So, do we have a contact out here, or are we just supposed to talk to anybody? Clint asked, looking around. Gad ran a finger down his sheet. Sergeant Farley, he read. Any idea where he is? Clint prompted as he came to a stop at one of the intersections. The corporal gave a sheepish shrug. Somewhere in the neighborhood? he asked. Clint rolled down the window and honked, lowering his sunglasses as a soldier ran up to him. The soldier skidded to a stop, blinking in confusion. This is no place for a civilian, he stammered. You need to— It's okay, he's with me, Gad called, leaning over in his full garb. We're looking for Sergeant Farley. The soldier nodded and pulled out a radio, pressing the button and raising it to his lips. Sergeant Farley, watch your twenty, he asked, and then held the walkie-talkie to his ear, nodding. Copy that, he finally replied. Sending a car your way. He lowered the radio and motioned to the vehicle. Two blocks up, one block over. He'll flag you down. Thank you, soldier, Clint said with a firm nod. He hit the gas, following the directions, 
and when they turned the corner, three men stood in the middle of the road. "'Guess that's them,' Clint said as a man in his late thirties with dark hair waved at them. He looked slightly out of shape, but still better than most. The two privates with him looked barely out of high school. Clint stopped the vehicle, and they got out, approaching the trio of soldiers slowly. They didn't look too thrilled to see them. "'Don't suppose you two were the supply runners?' the sergeant drawled, hooking a thumb into his belt. "'Kind of,' Clint replied, waving a hand around his head. "'We're the ones who tell the runners where to go. I'm Clint. This is Corporal Gad.' One of the privates rolled his eyes. "'Fantastic,' he said, sarcasm evident in his tone. "'You want to tell them to bring us some fucking bullets?' Gad looked at his papers. "'According to my records, you should have plenty to accomplish the lockdown mission,' he said. "'You may want to check that sheet again, buddy boy,' the other private snapped. "'Because we ain't got shit!' Gad bristled, but Clint held up a hand. "'Forget our numbers,' he said firmly. "'Sergeant, tell us your situation.' He cocked his head at the corporal, who pursed his lips and readied his pencil on a fresh page. "'I got eighteen men I'm responsible for. That's down from twenty-two just from yesterday,' Farley explained. "'Do you know why I'm short four men? Because we don't have the bullets to do our job safely and effectively. What's your paper say we have?' Gad fumbled with his papers, finally flipping to the right one. "'Says you should have enough rounds so that every man has half a magazine,' he reported. "'So that's what, fifteen each?' Farley chuckled darkly. "'So, your little paper there says we're supposed to have forty-five bullets between the three of us?' he asked, shaking his head. Gad nodded slowly. "'Yes,' he confirmed. "'Because you're front line and doing the clearing.' We have forty-seven bullets, the sergeant shot back. Not between the three of us, but for all eighteen men. He let that sit for a moment, and then raised a finger. We're so short that my men have standing orders only to shoot when someone is bitten, or you are facing down a runner. I don't know who gave you your information, but if you see them again, will you kindly smack the shit out of them for me? Consider it done, sergeant. Clint replied with a sharp nod. Gad shook his head in shock, flipping through his paperwork frantically to make sense of it all. I don't understand how our numbers can be that far off, he stammered. Well, they are. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? One of the privates demanded, crossing his arms. Clint sighed. Unfortunately, not much we can do at the moment, he said. We're trying to get our hands on more supplies, but we're weeks away. I'm sure we can convince the general to postpone the clearing until we are better supplied, the corporal added, or at least go at a slower pace. Oh, we're way ahead of you on that, Farley scoffed. We aren't doing any new breaches, just responding to breakouts. Once a building is compromised, we go in and clear. But we're not making any new work for ourselves. One of the privates jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the two-story office building behind him. And you boys are just in time to see what we're doing, he drawled. Had a breakout ten minutes ago. First room is secure, but with an exposed entry, we can't leave it that way for long. What do you say, Gad? Clint asked with a smirk. Want to get a little frontline experience? The corporal pursed his lips, tilting his head back and forth. Okay, he finally said with a nod. Could be good to have some first-hand knowledge of the situation. Atta boy! Clint said, clapping him on the back. So, what are we looking at inside, Sergeant? Farley motioned with his hands towards the building. Got six schools in exterior rooms, and based on experience, about the same number on the inside as well, he said. What are you basing that on, exactly? Gad asked, clasping his hands around the folder in front of him. Every building we've been in so far has had zombies on the outside, attracted by noise or movement the sergeant explained. There have only been a handful not near windows, usually stuck. One of the privates wagged his finger. So you two had better not jinx us by showing up, he declared. Gad let out a nervous laugh, clearly uncomfortable, and Clint turned back towards the car. 
He popped the trunk and pulled out two metal baseball bats, slamming the hatch down and rejoining the group. He held out a bat to the corporal. Gad sighed. Is this really necessary? he asked. One of the privates snorted. If that's your first question, then I sincerely hope not, he said. Gad sighed again and set his folder and pencil down on the sidewalk, gingerly taking the bat. He gripped it tightly, his jaw tense. Just keep a watch on our backs, Clint said, and stepped in front of him to follow the trio of soldiers towards the window. When they grew close, one of the privates reached down to the ground and picked up a couple of metal pipes. The tips had been filed down to a sharp, jagged point, and they were completely caked with blood, indicating a lot of use. Clint let out a low whistle. You boys have been busy, he said. You don't know the half of it, Farley replied, grabbing his own pipe. While they were celebrating down by the waterfront, we were out here getting our asses handed to us. I've put this pipe through the heads of at least a hundred of those things since the sun went down last night. And in this part of the country, this late in the year, you know we only get about forty-five minutes of daylight. Look at the bright side, though. At least we didn't have to put up with daylight savings time this year, Clint joked. The sergeant chuckled. Shit, that's almost worth the end of the world, he said. Light laughter rippled through the group as the privates climbed in through the window. As Clint and Gad brought up the rear, he studied the room. It was a small office, no doubt a desirable location at some point, given the nice large window. Now just a tomb filled with worthless paperwork and a blood-stained desk. "'What are we dealing with, Wilcox?' Farley asked the private at the door as he put his ear against it. He held up his finger, brow furrowing, and waited another few beats before straightening up. "'Little bit of movement!' he finally said. Nothing we can't handle? Check for movement, the sergeant instructed. Wilcox nodded and gently cracked the door. It creaked loudly, immediately drawing attention, and the door flew open as a large zombie in a tattered suit crashed through, sending him to the ground. The creature immediately honed in on him, but Clint stepped up and swung mightily, catching the ghoul right in the face. Its skull caved in and it crumpled to the ground in a heap. Farley grabbed Wilcox's arm and hauled him back to his feet. You good? he asked. The private nodded as he brushed himself off and looked to Gad. Think you can requisition me a pair of new boxers? he asked. Consider it done, the corporal quipped. Farley took point, and Clint came up behind him. Wilcox motioned for Gad to get into the middle and handed him a flashlight. You hear something, you shine it in that direction, he instructed. Gad nodded, fumbling around with the light before getting a firm handle on it. Farley and Clint walked into the middle of the office, a big open area with offices lining the wall. There was a reception desk in the middle of the room, messy with bloodstains. A corpse sprawled behind the desk, backwards across an overturned chair. "'Clint and I are going to check upstairs,' Farley said. "'Sawyer, Wilcox, you and the corporal start clearing offices.' The three soldiers nodded, and the sergeant led Clint to the side of the room where the stairs ascended to a landing before turning and going up to the second floor. The light upstairs was pretty good, with skylights illuminating the room. It was another large open space, with several cubicles and a trio of offices on the far wall. The duo reached the top, pausing to survey the situation. There were a few zombies to their right, shuffling towards them once they took notice. I got these three if you want to start checking cubes, Clint said. Farley nodded and moved to the opposite side of the room. Clint stepped up, waiting patiently for the first ghoul to reach him. It was a short blonde woman in a business suit that was missing most of her face. Her jawbone poked through a missing chunk of her cheek as she snarled at him. Clint swung downwards, caving in the top of its skull. He reset, waiting for the next one to arrive. Within moments he'd taken care of the whole room, and as the last one fell, the sergeant's voice echoed from the other side. Holy fuck! he barked. Clint whipped around. Farley had two zombies impaled on his pipe, one through the head and the other in the neck. The neck kebab ghoul writhed violently, pushing the limp corpse forward. 
Farley struggled to get them pinned against the wall so he could make a kill, but Clint caught movement past him, realizing it wasn't the pipe zombies that had the sergeant so spooked. Three zombies emerged from an office behind Farley, gaining quickly. Clint jumped up onto the desk of a cubicle, leaping over the short wall to the next desk, towards the sergeant and the incoming threat. He clambered onto the desk next to him, swinging the bat like a golf club, catching the lead ghoul in the face and crushing its skull. The impact was forceful enough to send the other two tumbling to the ground. Thanks, the sergeant huffed with a nod. Don't mention it, Clint replied brightly. He hopped down, walked over, and finished the job, caving in the remaining two skulls with ease. As he did that, Farley was able to plant his foot in the chest of the dead ghoul, driving him and the live one back just enough to free the pie from the thrashing one. He aimed his spike carefully, driving it forward into the creature's eye. He angrily yanked the weapon out of its face, kicking the corpse on the ground. Punk-ass bitch, Farley snapped. Clint walked over to him, laughing at the taunt. The sergeant wrinkled his nose in embarrassment. Sorry, he muttered. Clint raised a palm in surrender. Hey, don't be, he assured him. You be you, no judgment here. Appreciate that, Farley said. Come on, let's clear these offices so we can work on getting you some bullets, Clint said, and clapped him on the shoulder. The sergeant nodded in agreement, and they headed over to the next office to do it all over again. The duo spent the next several minutes going office by office, clearing each one and taking their time with special care. Finally, when they reached the final room, there was clear movement inside. Based on your experience, Clint drawled, what are the odds there's only one in there? Farley barked a laugh. About the same odds as Miss December is going to be waiting for me back in my room once this day is over, he quipped. Wait, you have a room? Clint gasped, feigning shock. The sergeant paused for a moment before shaking his head in disgust. So, in addition to those bullets, he trailed off. Housing is on our list, too, Clint said with a chuckle and a nod. Farley grinned. I'll take something on the waterfront if you can swing it, he said. Penthouse it is, Clint declared. The men shared a short laugh and then got back to it. Clint stood by the door as Farley readied his spike, nodding his readiness. Clint turned the knob and threw open the door, and immediately their entire field of vision was filled with ghouls. Farley instinctively jammed his pipe into the lead zombie's face, securing it to the tip. The creature went limp, and the pipe went down. Clint leapt up, pushing upwards on the pole so that Farley could aim, and hit another creature in the head. With the first two gone, the moans behind them intensified as their brethren got excited for fresh meat. There were easily a dozen or more zombies shuffling towards the door. Farley tried to pull his weapon free, but the ghouls were too attached to it. Before Clint could help, three zombies pushed past their dead comrades, getting dangerously close to Clint. Leave it, he barked. The sergeant shoved the corpses forward, buying them a second as the two of them retreated towards the stairs. Ghouls continued to pour out of the room, slowly moving towards them. Guess we know where everybody hid when shit went down, Clint grunted. Yeah, lucky us, Farley muttered. Clint looked around, seeing that most of the zombies were coming straight down the aisle to the right, towards them. It was not very wide, maybe two yards. He smirked before tossing his bat to the sergeant. "'I hope your swinging arm is good,' he said, rolling his shoulders. "'I'll manage,' Farley quipped as he snatched the bat out of the air. "'What the hell are you gonna do?' "'Little remodeling,' Clint replied, and grabbed one of the cubicle walls, ripping it free and putting it across the aisle. He used his body weight to anchor it to the ground. Farley smiled, tightening his grip on the bat as he realized what they were about to do. The first few shoved each other as they got close to the wall, their eyes focused intently on Farley. "'Yeah, come and get it,' the sergeant invited with a confident sneer. As they reached the wall, he delivered a forceful strike, knocking the first one to the ground before re-aiming and doing the same to the other. The next were a few steps behind. "'You good there?' Farley asked. Yeah, just don't let him climb over, Clint replied as he held fast. The sergeant gave him a nod, 
Wouldn't dream of it, he quipped. And for the next several minutes, he systematically took the zombies down one by one. When the last one dropped, Farley stood there for a moment, breathing heavily, straining his ears and eyes for any more movement. I think we're good, he finally said. Clint stood up, rubbing his shoulder with a wince as he got to his feet. You all right? Farley asked, brow furrowing. Yeah, just used it a little too much today, Clint replied, waving him off. I'm about at that age where stuff just isn't the same after it gets injured. The sergeant nodded. Tell me about it, he agreed, rubbing his own shoulder. Come on, let's go see what kind of trouble they got into down there. The duo walked to the stairs, spotting the three soldiers standing below next to a pile of corpses. Wilcox and Sawyer were taking a breather, while Gad bashed in a skull of a zombie on the ground. He hit it several times until the skull was liquefied, letting out a yell in the process. Whoa, Gad, I think he's down, Clint said as they descended the stairs. The corporal gave the zombie one last smack and then stood back, chest heaving. Well, he scared the shit out of me, he exclaimed. He needed to pay. Given I'm sharing a car with you for the rest of the day, I'm hoping that's just a metaphor, Clint joked, and the group all shared a laugh as they made their way back outside. Gad kicked the ghoul one last time and then joined them. They walked back across the grass and he knelt down to pick up his folder and pencil, juggling it with the bloody bat as he met Clint at the car. Gentlemen, I think it's safe to say that getting you more ammunition is going to be the top of our list, Clint declared. The sergeant nodded thoughtfully, crossing his arms. A few more rations couldn't hurt either, he added. We're expending a lot of energy out here, as you well know. We can power through a couple of days of this, but I get the feeling we're going to be at this for months. We will get you what you need, sergeant, Clint assured him. Farley extended his hand to shake and shook with Clint first, then the corporal. His radio crackled to life. Sergeant, we have another breach, somebody said through the walkie-talkie. Farley sighed and shrugged. No rest for the wicked, he said. Be safe, Sergeant, Gad said. The three soldiers headed off and the duo got into their car. They sat there for a few moments in silence, Clint not even starting the vehicle. Finally, the corporal took a deep breath. You know we're not going to be able to get them anything substantial, don't you? He asked softly. Very well aware, corporal, Clint replied with a cluck of his tongue. Gad cocked his head. Then why did you tell him that? he asked. Because those boys need some hope, Clint explained. They need to know they're not invisible out here. And I don't care what strings you have to pull, but we're at least getting them some extra rations. They can understand not getting the firepower they need, but not getting enough food? He shook his head sharply. That's a good way to kill morale. Gad scribbled away in his folder and then raised his chin. Okay, I'll make it happen, he agreed. Good man. Clint replied. So where to next? he asked. Gad flipped back to his checklist and scanned it. Okay, looks like the southern airfield to pick up inventory reports, he said. Sounds a whole lot less exciting than what we just went through, Clint joked. The corporal raised an eyebrow. I am 100% okay with that, he quipped. Clint chuckled and started the car, shaking his head. Before he could put the vehicle in gear, the radio crackled on. Corporal Gad, do you copy? Someone asked. The soldier picked up the radio and hit the button. Corporal Gad here, he said. What is your current location? The person asked. Just leaving the Cascade neighborhood? Gad reported. Headed towards the southern airfield. That can wait, Corporal, the person replied. General Stevens wants you and Clint to proceed to the stadium. They are making good progress on the census, and he wants you to pick up the information on the high-priority individuals. Gad wrinkled his nose. I had that to do at the end of the day, he replied. Did something change? Yes, you have a meeting in two hours with Washington, the person replied. The corporal nodded. Okay, we're on it, he promised. Please report to General Stevens once you finish up at the stadium, the person added. Copy that, Gad said. Out. 
He put the radio down and then shuffled his papers some more. Okay, back to the stadium, he said. Meeting with the president's team, Clint muttered as he pulled a U-turn, heading back towards the stadium. Already a bitch of a day and the sun is barely up. Chapter 2 The duo drove up to the stadium, and there were about a thousand people standing in line waiting to get in. Military personnel directed people around, walking by with clipboards and passing them around so they could start with paperwork. Clint and Gad got out of the car and walked towards the front. Man, nothing brings out a crowd quite like a census, Clint quipped. The corporal nodded proudly. Yeah, I suggested to the general that we incentivize taking the census, he declared. So you're proud of the fact that you bribed people to do their basic civic duty? Clint asked, cocking a brow. Yep, Gad replied, conviction in his tone. All right. Didn't think you had that in you, but good to know, Clint said with a shrug and a chuckle. What's their prize? They get put on the list for permanent housing, Gad replied. Right now we have glorified barracks that make refugee camps look like a high-end motel. Figure this will speed the process quite a bit. The older man blinked at him in shock. Wait, do we even have enough places for people to have permanent housing? He asked. It's a big city. Eventually we will, Gad replied. And I think people realize that it will take time, hence the line this early in the morning. Clint shook his head. Nothing like privacy to make you give up sleep, he muttered. So, who are we meeting here? Captain Galavan runs this facility, Gad replied. Been here since the start when we were just herding VIPs into them because we didn't have enough time to plan for what we would actually need. Clint clucked his tongue. Guessing the people they picked weren't so great? He asked. They made a few good choices, Gad said, tilting his hand back and forth. Some workers at the local power plants, a few with nuclear power expertise. They only managed to secure four farmers, however. He scoffed. Four? But they got twelve structural engineers. Clint shook his head. Don't go too hard on them, he said softly. They only had hours to secure the facility and people. It was a miracle that they were able to pull off what they did. That's true, Gad agreed, blinking in shock at the compassion from a man who had just a short time ago had suggested putting a child on a leash. But I can still be bitter at what we have to work with, because the obstacles we have to overcome don't give a damn about what they faced. Clint nodded slowly. Yeah. That makes sense, he agreed. Just don't say that in front of the captain. The corporal rolled his eyes. Come on, give me a little more credit than that, he said. I have more tact. Did you, or did you not, just hold housing over people's heads? Clint teased, a glimmer of mischief in his eye. Yeah, but I didn't tell that to their faces, Gad replied, puffing out his chest. Benefits of having rank. You can delegate that. Clint simply laughed as they walked up to a guard by the front gate. "'Can I help you, gentlemen?' the guard asked, shoulders straightening. "'This is Clint Rensfold,' Gad explained. "'And I'm Corporal Gad. I believe Captain Galvan is expecting us?' "'One moment,' the guard said, and raised his radio to his lips. "'I have two guests for the captain, Clint Rensfold and Corporal Gad.' He listened and waited. "'Bringing them up now,' he lowered the radio and nodded to the men. If you'll follow me, please. He walked them through the concourse, over to the stands overlooking the field. When they reached it, they looked out over thousands of people standing in a few dozen lines, all leading up to a series of tables. Can't remember the last time I saw this stadium so full, Clint said in awe. The guard tilted his head back and forth. I grew up here, and let me tell you, it's been a minute, he admitted. Those last few seasons were so brutal that it's almost a relief I won't have to watch them lose any more. Clint barked a laugh. I like it. Looking at the bright side of life, he said. Yes, sir. Doing what I can to get by, the guard replied, and looked down towards the field where a captain stood waving at them. There's Captain Galvan and his assistant Noah, he said, pointing. You two have a great day. You too, soldier, Clint replied. The duo walked down to the field where the older-looking captain stood with his assistant, an attractive young man wearing a business suit and holding a tablet computer. You must run a tight ship here, Captain, 
Clint bellowed as they approached. If you got your assistant dressing like that. Galvin shrugged, his graying hair glinting in the light. He just showed up like this, he said. The duo glanced at Noah, who glanced up from his tablet, staring down his male model nose at them. What can I say? he asked coquettishly, his perfect blonde hair slicked back. I grew up poor, and they cleared out the designer store a couple blocks away. Never looked this good before. Clint paused for a moment, and then chuckled, holding up a palm to the man. Noah stared at it, confused at first, and then enthusiastically gave him a high five. Hell yeah, Clint commended. You live your best life, young man. Gad rolled his eyes and turned to Galvin. Captain, I'm Corporal Gad, and my overly enthusiastic friend here is Clint Rensfold. General Stevens instructed us to come see you. I assume it's so you can pick up the first batch of census reports, Galvin replied. Clint's brow furrowed, and he looked down at his watch. Didn't you just start this process today? he asked. Yes, sir, we did, the captain replied. But we're processing twenty-five hundred people per hour. Clint nodded appraisingly. Got that line moving, captain, he said. Time isn't on our side, Mr. Rensfold, Galvin quipped. So we need to find the people we need to find, and do it fast. Noah raised a hand. And that's where I come in, he added. My team is digitizing all the files as we speak. Name, current location, occupation, special skills, and anything else they write down of note. Noah, 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 Clint said, shaking his head. We don't have time to wait for things to be turned digital. We're on a time crunch. Which is why you should be thankful I'm not just a pretty face, the assistant said waving a hand over his high cheekbones. I've had my team pull any paper files that might be of immediate use to you. You know, like people who specialize in growing food, or who worked at power plants. Might even have a few people who have experience in cracking skulls. Clint grinned and nodded. I'm going to keep my eyes out for a nice leather briefcase to steal for you, he said, wagging a finger at the well-dressed man. If I have a choice, I prefer lighter colored leather. Noah said with a smirk. Brings out my eyes. You get me the people I need, I'll get you a full wardrobe too, Clint promised. Galvin jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Noah, why don't you go pick up any other files your team might have and meet us back at their car in fifteen, he suggested. Yes, sir, Noah replied and headed off briskly to follow his orders. Gad watched the man scurry off and shook his head slowly. Where in the world did you find him at? he asked. His husband ran the agriculture department at the local college, Galvin explained. The husband was a VIP, but Noah there insisted on making himself useful. Would never tell me what he did before all this, most likely because he is embarrassed, but he's good at this, which is all I care about. The corporal nodded. So what can you tell us about the census so far? He asked, back on track. Can't say for sure, Galvin admitted. But from what I'm hearing, it's going to be an uphill battle finding what we need. Don't hold back, Captain, Clint drawled, sarcasm high in his tone. How do you really feel? Look, Mr. Rensfold, Galvin began. Clint, the ex-soldier cut in, raising his palm. Okay, Clint, the captain said with a sigh. The people who are most equipped to survive a zombie apocalypse are strong, fast, and can fight. Not exactly traits you typically find in people with the technical expertise we're going to require to survive long term. How many doctors you know who can fight off a horde of ghouls with a baseball bat? What about virologists? Electrical engineer? Computer tech? He counted off on his fingers. The list goes on and on, and with the way the virus was, we lost 40% of those people off the top. So no, Clint, I'm not optimistic about our chances, but we're going to give it a shot. Gad sighed. Well, that's depressing as hell, he said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. The truth usually is, Clint quipped. Sadly, you are correct, Galvin agreed. The trio looked out over the field, civilians everywhere, with a handful of soldiers in the mix. Giving your men some time off? Gad asked. The word spread that we need experts in certain fields, like the ones I just mentioned, Galvin explained. Anybody with that was taken off the front lines and brought here. It's a long shot, but given what we face, he trailed off, gazing down at the floor and shaking his head. 
After a beat, the corporal lowered his voice. "'You all right there, Captain?' he asked gently. "'Just a little PTSD,' Galvin admitted. "'I did some mission trip work before I joined the military, trying to help the poorest of the poor, people who were days away from starvation. Those images burned into my head. I look around at the number of people we have, and with winter on the way, just have a bad feeling.' The corporal shook his head. We have all the stores in Seattle, he insisted. Food banks, too. We should be able to ride things out. Maybe if we had half the population, Galvin shot back. How many survivors are there, Captain? Clint asked. The estimates we heard were topping out at 150,000. Galvin blinked and barked a horror laugh. Whoever gave you that number shouldn't be in charge of anything, he said darkly. Because either they can't count for shit or they're gaslighting you. Clint and Gad shared a concerned look. They both knew exactly who it was. Patterson, they said at the same time. Clint furrowed his brow. Was he the one who gave you the bullet numbers? he asked. Gad nodded. Yep, he confirmed. Galvin crossed his arms. You think he's doing it deliberately? he asked, and both men nodded in unison. Why? He's a sniveling little glory chaser, Gad snapped probably doing it to make himself look good by telling the general the news he wants to hear. Even with everything going on? The captain asked, his jaw dropping. He'd push his own mother down the stairs if he was the one who got to call the ambulance and save her, Gat scoffed. Galvin shook his head slowly. He sounds fun, he muttered. We'll deal with him when we get back, Clint said. But captain, if we don't have a hundred and fifty thousand people in town, how many do we have? The captain took a deep breath. I'll know for sure by the end of the week when we're finished with the census. But based on my tour of the survivor camps, he took a deep breath. A quarter million? Maybe up to three hundred thousand. Motherfucker! Clint muttered. Gad, with some choice words, threw his hands as well. Captain, we've taken up enough of your time, Clint said, holding out his hand to shake. We'll let you get back to it. Galvin nodded and shook with both of them. If you have any other questions or need anything, just let me know, he said. Thank you, Captain, Gat said, and as the captain walked away, Clint turned to him. So, rock, paper, scissors? he asked. The corporal blinked in confusion. For what? he asked. To see who gets to whoop Patterson's ass in a few minutes, Clint replied. Oh, he's all yours, Gat said, waving him off. Clint cocked a suspicious brow. You don't want to kick his ass? he asked. Oh, I'm going to hit him where it hurts, the corporal said firmly. His rank. Aw, Clint whined. But I wanted to make it hurt. Gad shrugged. By all means, please have your way with him, he said flippantly. Nothing wrong with a little tag team action? Hell yeah, Clint said, cracking his knuckles. We'll be like the road warriors. Smack his ass down. The corporal tilted his head back and forth. I was always kind of partial to the rock and roll express myself, he said. Clint blinked at him in shock. Really? he asked. Loved the high flyers, Gad said as they began to walk towards the exit. Can't beat the double dropkick finisher either. Clint nodded thoughtfully. They did get the girls too, didn't they? he added. Yeah, they did, Gad replied. Plus, we can't be the road warriors. I'd look terrible with a mohawk. Clint laughed and clapped him on the shoulder as they made their way to the car. Chapter 3 Corporal Gad carried a large document box with the census results into the command center, as Clint strolled next to him like he owned the place. He threw open the door with such force that it nearly cracked the glass, which got everyone's attention. He stomped right up to Sergeant Patterson's desk, standing there with his arms crossed. The middle-aged sergeant looked up from his paperwork with a sneer. Well, if it isn't the general's favorite little errand runner, he drawled. I don't have anything new for you. Come back later and I might, if you're lucky. Clint stood over him, looking down the front of his desk, menacing shoulders squared. I, Patterson stammered, his bravado shrinking rapidly. I told you I don't have anything. Clint jutted out his chin. Oh, we know, he said. The sergeant's eyes widened and sweat broke out on his brow. Well, 
I, um, he said, and then cleared his throat. I mean, you know, maybe I was a little off on my estimates. No, you were making shit up, Clint snapped. Well, it, Patterson stammered. It won't happen again. Damn right it won't, Clint snarled, and reached across the desk, grabbing the sergeant by the shirt. He yanked the man's flailing body across the metal, putting him in a chokehold and lowering his mouth to his ear. Do you have any idea the damage you could have caused? He snarled as the man gasped for air. People could have died because of your bullshit. Then for what? So you could move up the chain? Bitch, you ain't even getting paid anymore. Who the fuck cares about your rank? I'm sorry, Patterson choked. I'm sorry. What is the meaning of this? General Stevens boomed from the door to his office. Let that man go right now. Clint squeezed one last time before letting go, shoving the sergeant away from him. Patterson flopped on his desk, palm against his chest as he wheezed. You'd better have a damn good reason for doing that, Clint, Stevens snapped. Clint glanced over to Gad, who set his document box on the desk with a sigh. General, we've found two instances of Patterson's reports being way off, he said. We believe intentionally. Stevens furrowed his brow. How off? he asked. He said the frontline troops have five times the ammunition that they have, and the population of our community is half of what it actually is, Gad said. The general's eyes blazed as he let the information sink in, and then stepped over to the sergeant's still gasping form. So, you're a little glory chaser, he asked, his voice level but menacing. I tell you what, I'll give you the opportunity to get all the glory you could ever want. He pointed to two MPs standing at the edge of the room, and they approached immediately. Take him to the front lines. Let him clear a few houses. The MPs grabbed the sergeant, who squeaked protests, and dragged him out of the room. The general turned to the rest of the soldiers, who stared on in shock. Show's over. You have work to do, Stevens barked. And consider this a warning. If anybody else pulls shit like that... They're not going to the front lines. They're getting a bullet in the back of the head. He held up a firm finger. This is not the time or place for games. Now work like you have a purpose. The room went back to work frantically, and Stevens turned to the two still standing men. Good to see you still have a bit of fight left in you, Clint, he said, and his firm demeanor betrayed exhaustion beneath. But do me a favor. Try to keep it to a minimum in the office. We are trying to work here. Sorry, General, Clint replied sheepishly. People like that get under my skin. Stevens waved him off and nodded, motioning to the box. Those the census files? he asked. The ones they pulled for us, Gad confirmed. We have a meeting in thirty, Stevens replied. That going to give you enough time? The corporal tilted his head back and forth. If he can buy us a little time, that would be better, he said. You have an hour. Stevens replied. Free office at the end of the hall. I'll have some coffee brought in to you. Two people walked up to him, and he flicked his wrist at Clint and Gad. See you in an hour, he said, and then shuffled off to work on another problem with the newcomers. Gad held up the box with a grin. Ready to do some paperwork? he asked brightly. Clint wrinkled his nose and let out a grunt. That's the spirit, Gad quipped. Come on. Chapter 4 Gad and Clint walked into a small meeting room where General Stevens sat at the head of the table. On a large screen in front of him were John Teeter and General Adams, seated at a table in front of their own camera. Apologies, are we late? Clint asked. Nope, we're just getting settled, John assured him with a smile. Please have a seat and we can begin. The men took seats, setting down stacks of paper in front of them, with the high-level census data organized. So, gentlemen, before we get started, I want to mention that we have had an incident here, Stevens began. We had someone skewing the numbers, so I will have to correct some of the figures you have in front of you as we go along. Adams blinked, shaking his head. Skewing the numbers, he demanded. Why would someone do that? Because they are still caught up in the pettiness of the old world, Clint replied. They've been removed, so it won't be a problem going forward. Adams scowled. Very well, he finally said. General, why don't you kick things off? 
Thank you, Stevens replied. We have a secure area of about eight square blocks, branching out from the stadium. Every building has been cleared, and every way in has been fortified. Currently, we are pushing to the east and hoping to have everything from here to the interstate cleared within a week. We are hesitant to push further after that. John leaned forward, clasping his hands on the table in front of him. And why is that, General? he asked. Combination of things, Stevens explained. Lack of supplies, troop exhaustion. And to be quite frank, we have more important issues to deal with. Such as? Adams prompted. Securing a reliable food source? Gad cut in. As well as getting enough in the pantry so that we can survive the winter. Which is where our initial estimates need to be revised, Clint added, taking a deep breath. Yesterday we were working off of the belief that we had 150,000 people to feed. That number could be as high as 300,000. There was silence for a moment as everyone present contemplated that. Based on that new information, John began slowly. What is the current food situation? Gad flipped open his notebook, skimming the pages before finding the one he was looking for. He did some quick math on the side of the page. Based on the estimates from our scouts, who did a quick inventory of stores and the like, he said, we can maintain a thousand calorie a day diet for the next six weeks. More somber silence. Is that even enough time to get food growing? Adams asked hoarsely. Clint shrugged. Some crops, maybe, he said. But we haven't even taken back the farms yet. I assume that's a priority? Adams prompted. Yes, General, Gad confirmed, tapping his pencil on the page. At the moment, we are locating the local farmers who survived and figuring out what we need and where we need to go. Adams's brow furrowed. Why aren't we just clearing every farm? he asked. It's not that easy, General, Gad replied, shaking his head. We need to know what they were growing before, how long the fields need to be prepped, and what we can even grow this time of year. We will have teams sent out in the next day or so to begin the process. Adams clucked his tongue. We're on a tight timetable, Corporal, he warned. And with all due respect, General, an extra day or two isn't going to be the difference between us starving or not. Gat countered patiently. We need time to line up our shot and take it, rather than hip-firing. Adams paused and then sighed with a nod. Okay, I'll take your word on that, he said. However, do we even know if anything can be grown that quickly in these conditions? Yes, Stevens cut in. I had a conversation with a farmer this morning, and there are crops that we can get on the fast track. However, it's going to be five to six weeks before anything will be harvestable. John raised his hand, pen in the air. May I make a suggestion? he asked. Please, Stevens replied, waving to him. If we cut back on the daily calorie count to 750, that will stretch the current food supply out to eight weeks, he explained. It's going to make a lot of people unhappy, but I'd like to believe starving to death would make them even unhappier. Adams cocked his head. Is it possible to spare some men to explore the outer areas of the safe zone? he suggested. Surely there is more food out there. That will be difficult to pull off, given everything my men are currently undertaking, Stevens explained. Securing the region, crowd control, distribution. I mean, we do have some scouts that are roaming around, but most of them are helping to coordinate the transport of their finds to make things easier. Clint held up his papers, waving them back and forth. I have a suggestion, he said, tapping them on the tabletop. We have plenty of capable civilians. I'm sure I can convince some of them to take on the risk of venturing outside the safe zone, provided you are okay with me giving them some incentive. Adams pursed his lips. What kind of incentive? he asked reluctantly. Prime living conditions, Clint replied smoothly. A percentage of the goods they find, stuff like that. The men on the screen turned and conversed quietly together for a moment. Finally they turned back around and John folded his hands on the table again. That would be... Acceptable, he said slowly, so long as they are going to places our scouts aren't going to, and you keep that percentage reasonable. Clint nodded. Thank you, he said. Any other bright ideas? Adams asked. I have another, actually, Clint replied, and dug through his paperwork, pulling out a single sheet. He handed it over to General Stevens, who scanned it before speaking. Harmony Radicott, he said slowly, shaking his head. Is that name supposed to mean something to me? Both Adams and John shrugged, sharing a confused glance. Wait, Gad finally said, snapping his fingers. 
Harmony Radicott? Isn't she that outspoken anti-government commune leader? Clint nodded with a grin. The very same, he said proudly. Adams' eyebrows hit his hairline. So your bright idea is to enlist the help of a communist hippie? he demanded. Yes, General, that is my bright idea, Clint snapped. And if you'll drop the condescending attitude for a moment, I'll explain why. Adams wrinkled his nose and pursed his lips, crossing his arms with a huff and nodding for him to continue. Harmony ran an off-grid commune with over fifteen hundred people, Clint began. They were self-sustaining for years. No power, no services. Everything they did was on their own. She is an expert on surviving in the very same situation we find ourselves in now. Sure, we might have power, but services are minimal, and we don't know how long either of those is going to last. If anybody can make us more efficient, my guess is it's her. Adams threw up a hand. What makes you think someone who hated our government so much that they chose to live like a medieval peasant would be willing to help now? He asked with a sneer. Stevens held up the paper he'd been perusing during the conversation. Because she was one of the first people in line for the census, he piped up. If she didn't care, she would have slept in this morning. Adams took a deep breath. Very well, he conceded. Couldn't hurt to talk to her. Stevens slid the paper over to Clint. Top priority once we're done here, he said. Yes, sir, Clint replied. What's next on the agenda, General? John asked. Couple of minor things, Stevens replied, running a finger down his own page. Our ammunition situation is, to put it mildly, dire. Captain Kersey and his team were just dispatched to Idaho to hopefully remedy that situation. Adams nodded. Please keep us posted with updates, he instructed. I will, Stevens replied. And, in a lone bright spot of good news, our water situation is actually looking good. The water treatment facility is in good shape, and should be operational again within the week. In the meantime, we have a large supply of bottled water, and we are using the desalinization features on the ships at bay to offset any potential shortage. John raised his chin. And what about power? he asked. The command center and stadium area are being powered via a ship, Gad replied, shuffling his paperwork. However, we expect to have minimal power restored within a day or two. The local power plants are in remarkably good shape and we're just making sure things are triple-checked before flipping the switch. With any luck, we should have the entire safe zone powered up fully by the end of the week. What about fuel? Adams asked, drumming his fingers on the table. The corporal let out a deep breath. That's another story entirely, he said. We are, quite literally, running on fumes here. Any potential solutions to the problem? John asked. Gad nodded. Yes, sir, I believe so. He flipped through his pages. My team has located a target in the Canadian oil fields, small town of Dawson Creek. Clint cocked a brow. Dawson Creek? he drawled. Seriously? Yes, seriously, Gad replied. It's a real place, and about eight hundred miles north of Seattle. Adams pursed his lips. That's one hell of an outing, he quipped. With the current fuel shortage, can we even get there? Yes, General, we can, the corporal assured him. We've managed to locate enough fuel for a plane to get a small team of soldiers and oil workers there. However, it's a one-way trip, at least for the time being. John scribbled away on his notepad. Do we have any indication that the site is operational? he asked. We don't, unfortunately, Gad admitted, shaking his head. However, based on the proximity to so many oil fields with pipelines that come our way, it's our best option at the moment. If we get a team up there... How long will it be before they can get the oil flowing? Adams pressed. The corporal sighed. My honest answer is, who knows? He admitted with a shrug. Even if the town is safe, which probably isn't a great bet, they're going to have to get the rigs going, as well as check the pipeline, of which there are 800 miles off. In an ideal world, it could take a week or two before we even see a drop of oil reach a refinery. In this world, we might not see anything until spring, if at all. Adams grunted. "'You don't sound very optimistic, Corporal,' he said gruffly. "'Honestly, I'm not,' Gad admitted. "'This is a complex operation, and we're going in blind and short-handed. "'And whoever we send needs to understand that it's a one-way trip,' Clint added. "'That Dawson Creek might be their new home.' "'I agree with Clint,' 
Stevens put in. This mission will have a better chance of success if they know what they're getting into, fully. Make it so, General, Adams said. Stevens nodded. Yes, sir, he said, and then glanced at his companions next to him. And unless you two have anything to add, I think that's all we have. Gad and Clint both shook their heads, but John raised his hand on the screen. I do have one more thing, General, he prompted, and then pulled a keyboard towards him, clacking away on a few keys. A satellite image filled the screen, a close-up of an interstate. There were piles of corpses in the road, with metal devices in the street surrounded by zombies. I had my team pore over satellite imagery of Portland to investigate the effectiveness of the bombardment before the saddle offensive began, John said. This image was flagged. Stephen's brow furrowed. What are we looking at? he asked. Signs of a struggle, John explained. We compared it to images taken a couple of days before the assault, and none of this was here. We've concluded that our intelligence was incorrect and our actions had a negative impact on survivors up there. Clint's eyes widened. So, this image is of them trying to escape from the horror show we sent their way? he asked. That's our working theory, yes, John replied. What would you like us to do? Stevens asked immediately. General, I know you're short on manpower, Adams cut in. But we talked it over, and we feel like if there are survivors who are negatively impacted by our actions, it might be in our best interests to get ahead of it. We already have enough enemies between the undead and supply shortages. Adding in armed resistance is something I would like to avoid, if possible. Yes, sir, Stevens replied with a sharp nod. I will dispatch a team today to go investigate. We will keep you posted on the developments. John clicked a key, and the screen returned to their faces. Thank you for all of your hard work, men, he said sincerely. We will be in touch in a few days. Thank you, Stevens replied and the screen went blank. He slumped in his chair. General, do you want us to handle the Portland situation? Gad asked. Stephen shook his head. No, that's okay. I'll take care of it from my end, he assured them. We have some teams down south near Tacoma, so they'll be in a better spot to take off. Besides, I need you to go out and find Harmony Radicott and convince her to work for us. Pretty sure we have some leads on scavengers as well, Clint added. We can track them down once we find her. Make it so, Stephen said, his exhaustion making an appearance on his face again. Just do what you can to limit military involvement. The civilian population is going to need something to do. We have manpower, and we should be utilizing it. Agreed, General, Gad said firmly. Clint raised a hand. You're half right, General, he cut in. They do need something to do, but it can't all be work. They're going to need entertainment, too. With all due respect, I'm not sure entertainment is high on the list, Stevens replied dryly. These people are scared, living in horrible conditions. Some of them, and their loved ones, are going to be facing danger, and they're going to have to survive on scraps for God only knows how long, Clint said firmly. I'm just saying... Having some movies, video games, and books might go a long way to keeping them from openly revolting. The soldiers shared a look, and then shrugged. No more than ten percent of the scavengers are to look for that stuff, Stevens conceded. Food and weapons first. Yes, sir, Clint agreed. Stevens stood up. Go find Harmony, he instructed. Let me know what else you need. He left to a chorus of yes, sir, and then the other men got up from their seats as well. Ready to go hunt for a hippie? Clint asked. Gad shrugged and said, Didn't have that on my apocalypse bingo card, but let's do it. Chapter 5 Clint drove the duo towards a refugee shelter to the south of the stadium. They managed to get three blocks before the streets became thick with people, to the point where they couldn't drive any further. Clint inched forward for several minutes before pulling over and frustratedly throwing the vehicle into park. What are you doing? Gad demanded. Our place isn't for three more blocks. Clint threw his hand towards the windshield. And at the rate we're going, we'll starve to death before we get there, he drawled. Besides, we could use some exercise. I thought I got my exercise in by swinging that bat, the corporal said dryly. Can't skip leg day. 
Clint quipped brightly. Come on. Gad let out an exasperated sigh as the two of them got out of the vehicle. He grabbed a messenger bag from the back seat and slung it over his shoulder, shoving all of his paperwork into it. The civilians walking by them seemed like they were in a daze, as if they were still coming to grips with being able to even walk around outside without fear of being eaten alive. Gad came around to the other side of the car to join up with Clint. They stood there, looking around at all of the people. The buildings lining the road were shops, with only one or two of them open. One was a coffee shop with a couple of soldiers guarding the outside, and the other was a clothing store that appeared to have been completely ransacked. Well, at least they're guarding the important stuff, Clint joked. Gad shook his head. Come on, let's get walking, he said. They moved to the middle of the road and began their journey, taking notice of the people that passed them. They seemed to be from all walks of life, businessmen, families, lots of middle-aged men with survivalist beards. There were quite a few people walking with sidearms, but no long or assault rifles. Kind of surprised more people aren't armed to the teeth, Clint mused. They've started confiscating rifle ammunition, so their guns are effectively worthless, Gad explained. We set up a food for rifles program. Clint nodded slowly. Guess whoever made that call was wise enough to realize that if they tried to take their handguns, it would be a lot more trouble than it was worth, he said. Thank you. That was my suggestion, the corporal said, puffing out his chest a little. Luckily, they bought it. After a moment of silence, Clint took a deep breath. I got a question for you, he said slowly. Gad shrugged, raising a curious brow. We have the time, he said. Go for it. With as out of shape and totally unathletic as you are, why in the world did you want to join the military? Clint asked. Did you have dreams of being a battlefield hero or something? The corporal snorted. Hardly, he admitted. My dad was a man's man. Marines, served for twenty years, played football, wrestled. Olympic or professional? Clint asked, cocking his head. Professional, actually, Gad replied. Well, local shows, but still was in the ring getting thrown around like a rag doll. Clint raised a fist. Please tell me he had an awesome name, he said. The Crusher. Sergeant Kickass. Something. The Paratrooper, Gad said dryly. His companion raised an eyebrow. That? He drew out the word and then shook his head. I'm not sure how I feel about that, actually. His finishing move was a flying headbutt off of the top rope, Gat said, raising his hand to show the trajectory of the flight. He would get up there, pull out a flight helmet, and put it on before jumping headfirst toward the other wrestler. Clint barked a laugh. Okay, I approve, he said. That's pretty badass for a local promotion. He only did it for a few years, Gat said with a sad smile but it was fun to watch him on Sunday afternoons doing that. Clint nodded thoughtfully. So, let me guess. You weren't exactly following in the old man's footsteps? He asked. The only trophies I had on my shelf growing up were for perfect attendance and math awards, the corporal admitted. Oof, Clint said with a wince. That couldn't have been an easy household to grow up in. It wasn't as bad as some had it, Gad said. Growing up on military bases, you see a lot of things. Some of those guys just couldn't handle it if their little Johnny or Billy wasn't out there busting heads like they were. My dad had his moments of frustration that he had to go to trivia contests in a poorly lit lunchroom rather than watching his son under the Friday night lights. He sighed. But he eventually came round to who I was. Clint nodded slowly. So, what did he think about you joining the military? He asked. He was concerned about me, but he was proud, Gad admitted. Made a call on my behalf to an old captain of his, letting him know that I wasn't exactly cut out for grunt life. Luckily for me, the military needs more than just people who can fire weapons. Your old man's still around? Clint asked. Gad shrugged. Maybe, he said. Him and his fourth wife retired to Belize about five years back. We talked about a week before all this went down, but haven't been able to make contact since. Pretty sure unless I hop a boat and make a trip, I'll never know for sure. But in my mind, he's running around cracking zombie heads and living the beach life. Clint snorted. Based on what you've told me, he said, 
He's probably charging admission to watch him crack those skulls. Gad let out a half-hearted laugh. It was clear that he wanted to hope it was true, but the reality was that it probably wasn't. That's a great thought, he said softly. They stopped in front of a large shopping mall entrance, and the corporal checked his paper, then the address. We here? Clint asked. Yep, third floor, Gad confirmed. There's a bookstore near the back called Paperbacks Aplenty that she listed as her residence. Clint shrugged. Well, if it hasn't been gutted like the clothing store, remind me to pick up something to read, he said. What do you like? Gad asked as they strolled into the mall. A good scary story, Clint replied. The corporal blinked up at him. Really? he asked. With everything that's going on, you want to read a scary story? The horror in the books takes my mind off of the horrors in the real world, Clint said. Gad shook his head vehemently. That makes no sense, he said. Of course it does, Clint insisted. I know that ghosts aren't real, so it helps me relax. The corporal threw up his hands. Hell, a month ago zombies weren't real, but here we are, he shot back. You sure ghosts aren't real? Clint opened his mouth and then closed it again, taking a beat to reconsider. God damn it, he muttered, shaking his head. Don't you ruin ghosts for me. I need to relax. Gad rolled his eyes and they headed down a long hallway. A stream of people were heading in either direction, in and out. Finally the duo reached the mall opening and took a step to the side of the crowds to take it all in. Jesus Christ! Clint breathed. There were thousands of people spread out everywhere. Most of the shops were open, with the exception of food stations, and there was barely room to move. It looked like two Black Fridays overlapping. There were so many bodies everywhere. The skylights above illuminated the three-story mall pretty well, really showing off the interior. A group of soldiers set up emergency lighting along the balcony so that it wouldn't be pitch black inside once the sun set. People seemed peaceful, mostly just sitting around minding their own business, shell-shocked from the last month. A few shopped, with some guards at the stores making sure people only were taking an item or two. There was no real rationing going on with clothing and other non-essential items, but having the guards did keep the peace. How many of these places are there around town? Clint asked. Gad tilted his head back and forth. Twenty? he asked. Twenty-five? Not all of them are this big. Still, Clint drawled, taking a deep breath. I'm starting to think that Captain Galvin's estimate might be low. For the love of God, Gat begged, don't you dare put that evil in the air. You know what that could mean? Clint nodded. I do, he said. Which is why I'm not saying it out loud. Last thing we need are rumors spreading. Good. At least we're on the same page for that, Gat said sharply. Come on, let's find Harmony. They worked their way through the crowd towards the stairs. When they reached the top, they looked out over the landing towards the back of the mall. Again, they took a moment to take it all in, seeing it stretch on for a couple of city blocks. Nothing but a sea of people. I better be right about Harmony, Clint muttered. Gad took a deep breath. For all our sakes, he said. The duo found the next set of stairs up, getting up to the third floor, where there were fewer people. Good to see people are still inherently lazy, Clint joked. Two flights of stairs was just a little too much for them. Gad surveyed the area, and then finally pointed towards the bookstore. Got it, he said. They approached the store where half a dozen people sat out front, sprawled out on camping chairs, reading books and snacking on trail mix. As they approached, a young man stood up, clasping his hands in front of him. "'Can I help you?' he asked politely. "'We're looking for Harmony Radicott,' Gad said. The man looked worried for a moment, and then straightened his thin shoulders, raising his chin. His attempt to look intimidating failed miserably, but it was an A for effort. "'What makes you think she's here?' he asked haughtily. Clint smirked. "'We're the government. We know everything,' he said. The man's eyes widened in panic, and Gad shot his partner a death glare. "'Why are you trying to hassle us?' the man stammered. "'Even before all this, you people would constantly make our lives difficult.' 
We just want to be left alone. It's okay. Go back to your book. A woman called as she emerged from the bookstore. She looked to be in her mid-thirties and was bold as the day she'd been born, tattoos snaking around her body as she planted her hands on her hips. They know where I am because I told them. She stepped up to the young man and put a hand on his shoulder, coaxing him back to a seated position. He looked up at her with confusion, but complied, curling back up with his book. If you sought me out this quickly, it would appear as though my fears about our situation are well founded, Harmony said as she addressed the newcomers. If not, quite a bit worse. Miss Radicott, Clint said. She chuckled, waving a hand around her head. Do we really strike you as the formal type? She drawled. Please call me Harmony. I can work with that, Clint said, motioning between him and his partner. I'm Clint, and this is Corporal Gad. It's a pleasure, gentlemen, she said, and turned back to the store, waving for them to follow. Please come on in. She led them inside the bookstore, which the commune had basically taken over. They'd move the bookcases around to create some sleeping pods, and about a dozen people sat around the edges of the room reading. A young woman was in the far corner, reading a children's book to six kids sitting in a semicircle around her. Harmony walked into the storeroom off of the back wall, which had a handful of chairs stacked around. It was a little dark, with only a few candles to illuminate the space. Sorry, it's a little bit dim in here, but I figured you'd want privacy for this conversation she said. Gad nodded. You'd be right, he said. She motioned for them to sit down, and all three of them took seats, facing each other. Harmony crossed her legs and laced her fingers over her knee. So, gentlemen, she prompted, why don't you tell me what's up? We have way more people up here than we can realistically care for, Gad began, cutting right to the chase. She nodded, as if she'd suspected all along. How many are there? Could be as high as three hundred thousand, Clint said. She let out a low whistle, and then nodded. That's a lot of mouths to feed, she said. Which is why we're coming to you, since you have some expertise in feeding lots of people while off the grid, Clint explained. She sighed. How bad is the situation? she asked. Well, Gad said slowly, we don't know for sure, as we're still crunching numbers, and we'll be out of food in eight weeks. Clint cut in. Gad glared at him, but the other man shrugged. What? he defended. She needs to know the severity of the situation we're in. The corporal clenched his jaw, but finally gave a begrudging nod. And during that eight weeks, we're going to be on extremely limited diets, he said. Harmony took that in for a moment, and then licked her lips. So, what do you need from me? she asked. In the short term? Clint asked, leaning forward. We need you to find every square inch within the safe zone where you can plant food, preferably stuff that can grow quickly. She shrugged. Not going to be the tastiest for a lot of people, but leafy greens like spinach can grow in six weeks, she suggested. Great, everybody gets a leaf to snack on, Gad muttered. Better than starving, isn't it? She quipped. For us, yes, Clint said, winking at her. For some of those manly men we have in the military, they're going to be less happy. She smirked. They'll get over it, she said. That they will, Clint agreed. I'm going to need every bit of planting soil you can manage, Harmony continued. The ground up here is going to be too hard to really do much of anything, unless we have some serious machinery. Clint shook his head. Fuel shortage, he said. Figured, she replied with a nod. I'm also going to need every supercenter greenhouse area every pane of usable glass and any place in town that gets more than a few hours of sunlight, which this time of year is going to mean rooftops and places on the coast. Gad nodded thoughtfully. Can probably set some up on ship decks, too, he suggested. If we can tap into the ship's power, we can build them below deck, too, she continued, provided we can find enough lights, that is. Clint nodded. Assume we're natural light only for the time being, he said. The power will come, but finding the proper lights might be a problem. Understandable, she said. Gad scribbled some notes on a blank piece of paper from his bag, and then raised his gaze to her. What else do you need? he asked. Anybody with construction experience, Harmony replied. Preferably those who don't mind taking orders from a woman. Clint shook his head. 
I think after we made it clear to them that they either work or we all starve, they won't care who is giving orders, he said. You'd be surprised, she retorted. I heard stories from my stepsisters of their work experiences through the years, Gad put in. I would not be surprised by anything you might encounter. Harmony tongued her cheek. So, I have a question, she said. Okay, Gad prompted, pencil at the ready. I'm guessing farms are out of the question, she asked. Clint nodded. For the time being, he said. We have clear teams going to them, but it's going to be a while before we have them secure. They are way outside the safe zone, and that's a lot of territory to cover. Understandable, she said. So what else do you need? Gad asked. She shrugged. To get started? She asked, shaking her head. Nothing else, except for a military escort around the buildings and to the supply houses. We will have our scouting done today, figure out the best places to build, and have seeds in the ground by morning. She raised a finger. I do have a demand, however. Gad tilted his head back and forth. I mean, we can try, and what would you like? Clint cut in. There are about eighty of us from the commune who made it this far, Harmony said, inclining her head towards Clint in thanks. None of us are happy about being in town, but we fully understand it's a necessity at this point. Once we help you get past this immediate food shortage crisis, we are going to need a farm for ourselves. The men shared a glance and a shrug. We should have plenty of available farmland, Gad said slowly, but there will most likely be conditions on handing it over. Well, that's good, because I have conditions on it as well, Harmony said with a grin. We're going to need security on the perimeter. Could be as simple as building fences, but having some patrols going through would be nice in the meantime. Clint nodded. We can arrange that, he said. Good, she replied with a sharp nod. Once we're secure, we're going to want to be left alone as much as possible. The food we grow is ours to do with as we see fit. We keep what we want and use the rest as trade with the city. Gad wrinkled his nose. We might not be able to meet those demands exactly as you envision them, he said as gently as possible. However, I will tell you that we have a shortage of farmers in this community, so having people who can, you know, actually make stuff grow will be an easy sell to the higher-ups. How do you feel about training a new generation of farmers? Clint suggested. She contemplated for a moment, and then finally nodded. Provided they don't mind following our rules as I teach, I'm happy to share my knowledge, she agreed. We can work with that, Clint said. The corporal stuffed his paperwork back into his bag. If you want to rally your people together, I'll have your escorts here within the hour, he said. I will also have a direct contact person for you, so if anything comes up, you'll get an answer quickly. She smirked. Handing me off, huh? She joked. Am I too much for you to handle? For the corporal, a kindergarten teacher would be too much for him to handle. Clint quipped. Just trying to comprehend what would be required for you would break his little mind. Gad huffed. For your information, I... He sighed. Yeah, you're probably right. Harmony laughed. Don't worry, Corporal, she said gently. When we get through this, I'll introduce you to some nice, laid-back farmer girls. Bet they'll shuck your corn stork. Clint bit off what he'd been about to say, cursing himself and closing his eyes in embarrassment. And that is horribly inappropriate. I sincerely apologize. He let out a deep breath as the other two looked on at him in amazement. No need, Harmony said, waving him off with a laugh. That was actually pretty good. Haven't heard that one before. If you'll excuse us, Gad said, getting to his feet, I'm going to get him out of here before he decides to open his mouth again. Clint stood as well. It was, you shut your mouth and move, Gad scolded, ushering him out of the room. Clint just smiled and waved to the bold woman as the corporal practically dragged him out of the bookstore. They remained silent as they went down the stairs and headed out of the mall. When they reached the street, Clint couldn't take it any more, and burst out laughing, holding his gut. That was not funny, Gad said sternly. Clint clapped him on the back. I thought it was, he replied, and if you're lucky, I'm right about it too. The corporal wrinkled his nose and shook his head. Ugh, he said with disgust. Let me see where we're going next. Clint looked around, spotting a small restaurant that was open on the counter. 
A few people emerged from the front door with big smiles on their faces. Come on, let's grab a bite to eat, Clint suggested. Wait, what? Gad asked, confused. Clint led the way over to the restaurant, which was a small grill-type place. They walked in, and it was mostly empty, just a couple of people sitting and munching on something unidentifiable. They walked up to the counter and rung the bell. A moment later, the cook stuck his head out from the back. "'Sorry, friends and family only,' he said. "'We may not be family,' Clint drawled, "'but you would very much like to be our friend.' The man looked intrigued and came out from the back, standing behind a register. He was a large man with a beard and looked like the type who'd been a short-order cook for decades. "'Why would I want to be your friend?' he asked. Clint reached over and pulled a pen from the man's apron. He took the order pad and jotted down, "'Good for one double shipment of supplies,' and then signed it, sliding it back across the counter. "'And I'm just supposed to take your word on that?' the cook asked, shaking his head and laughing. "'Think of it as a low-risk bet,' Clint replied. "'You're wagering two orders of whatever that stuff is against the potential of getting twice as many crates of supplies when we start handing out goods. Choice is yours, my friend.' The cook contemplated for a moment before folding up the paper and stuffing it into his pocket. "'Have a seat,' he said. "'I'll bring it out to you in a minute.' Gad blinked. "'But we didn't order,' he said. "'I have portobellos, and I have portobellos,' the cook replied. "'Take your pick.' The corporal shrugged. "'Portobello it is, then,' he said. The duo took a seat by the window, looking out into the street, and watched as people moved about. "'Just for the record,' Gad said quietly. You can't be handing out slips like that. Clint shrugged. Why not? he asked, leaning back comfortably in his seat. This is as close to being a VIP as we're ever going to get. Might as well enjoy it a bit. Unless, of course, you want to eat an MRE today for dinner? Gad wrinkled his nose and then shook his head. Okay, but no more than one of those a day, he warned. Fine, Clint said and shrugged. So, what's our next task? Food should be our biggest priority, Gad replied, so I think we should focus on finding some scavengers. Clint nodded, leaning forward. Break out the paperwork and let's start digging, he said, clapping his hands together. Gad pulled a stack of papers from his messenger bag and tossed it on the table. They each grabbed a handful and began working their way through them. After a couple of minutes of focusing on their task, the cook arrived with two trays. Each tray held a large, juicy, steaming portobello mushroom on it, and he set them down. Both men's eyes lit up at the sight. "'Thank you, good sir,' Clint said, licking his lips. Gad motioned to the food. "'Where in the world did you get these at?' he asked. "'Rode this whole ordeal out in my restaurant here,' the cook replied. "'Got a nice little apartment upstairs and a rooftop garden. Decided to open back up to see if any of my regulars made it through.' He pointed to a couple a few seats down. Those two have been coming in for five years. And we're not letting the end of the world stop us either, the man sitting there quipped. Food that good, huh? Clint asked. You're about to find out, the man said, inclining his head towards the steaming plate. Clint gave him a thumbs up and turned to his meal, savoring the scent. That is amazing, he groaned. I can't remember the last time I had a properly prepared meal especially one that didn't come out of a can or freeze-dried pouch. "'Well, if your little I.O.U. comes through, you're welcome back any time,' the cook said. "'Now you enjoy.' He walked off, and the men dug in, slowly chewing and enjoying every bite. "'I have to admit,' Gad said in between forkfuls, "'at first I didn't approve of your little stunt, but damn if it wasn't worth it.' Clint winked at him. Stick with me, kid, and I'll show you how to game the system for personal profit, he joked. Gad raised his stack of papers. Might make things easier if we manage to find some people, he said. It's always work, work, work with you, isn't it? Clint said with a sigh as he finished his mushroom. Just motivated to keep eating good food like this, Gad replied as he polished off his own plate. The two of them continued poring over their lists shaking their heads at some of the people deemed potentials. "'We really need to have a chat with the people making these decisions on who is noteworthy or not,' Gad muttered under his breath. "'What you got?' Clint asked. The corporal tossed the paper over so he could see. "'A college baseball coach?' he said. 
What in the hell good is that going to do us? Clint looked over the paper and then nodded to himself. Wait, Gad said, leaning forward. You don't actually think he's a legit pull, do you? We're running short on bullets, but there are plenty of baseball bats and other bludgeons to be found, Clint explained. Having someone who can teach proper swing technique could be useful, especially given that ibuprofen is going to be hard to come by in the near future. The corporal thought about it for a moment, and then nodded in agreement. Okay, maybe they are thinking outside the box up there, he conceded. But even if he could train a baseball bat-wielding gang, it doesn't exactly help us in our current spot. True, Clint admitted. They continued to dig, shaking their heads at every single option. Finally, Clint slammed down the last sheet, letting out an exasperated sigh. Well, I give up, he muttered. Half these people couldn't survive out there on their own. The other half is too valuable to send out there. You got anything? Gad shook his head. About the same, he replied. If we can get the infrastructure back operational, it looks like we can hold things together. But that doesn't help us now. Maybe go back to the stadium and see if they've pulled anybody else? Clint asked. The cook stepped out from behind the counter, giving the front of the register a wipe with his rag. So what is it you guys are looking for? he asked casually. The duo shared a look before shrugging and nodding. We're looking for some adventurous types who wouldn't mind leaving the safe zone to find us some goods, Clint replied. Gad crossed his arms. You wouldn't happen to know anybody that would fit that bill, would you? he asked. The cook finished his wiping and stood up straight, tapping his chin. Can't say for certain that they're still alive and kicking, but if anybody is, they would be, he said. Sounds like our kind of guys, Clint said. Any idea where we could find them? Gad asked. The cook motioned vaguely out the window. You familiar with Lake Union? he asked. North of here? Gad asked. The cook nodded. Yep, he confirmed. On the east side, there are some older businesses. Find a bar called the Chopper Stop. Should be a block or so off of the water. Sounds like a biker bar, Gad said. Yep, owned by a local gang called the Slayers the cook explained. The corporal's eyes widened with worry, but Clint grinned. Don't look so concerned, he said. This isn't exactly a job meant for Boy Scouts. True, but... Gad trailed off, shaking his head. But nothing. Come on, Clint said and got to his feet. They collected their papers and the corporal refilled his messenger bag. Don't forget about our deal, the cook warned, pointing a finger at Clint. He raised his palms. Oh, I won't, he promised. You have my word. He turned to leave and then paused. Oh, and in your various travels, if you come across a nice leather briefcase, hold on to it for me, will you? Light-colored leather. The cook cocked a brow but nodded in agreement. Gad shook his head as they walked back outside. Dude, what are you doing, running a flea market stand? He asked. Basically, yeah, Clint replied with a grin. That's how to get stuff done in logistics and in the business world. Create networks, make connections, and find things that nobody else can find. Gad paused as he chewed that over. Good to know, he finally murmured. Chapter 6 Clint drove the duo up to an older-looking building with a hand-painted sign reading, The Chopper Stop. Parked below it was a handful of high-end motorcycles. The building itself stood out amongst the newer construction in the area, with old concrete walls that looked like they hadn't been pressure-washed in decades. This has to be the place, Clint said. Gad swallowed hard. You sure about this? he asked. Hey, you saw the list, Clint drawled, flicking the messenger bag. This is our best chance if we want to get a group out tomorrow. Time is of the essence, after all. The corporal sighed. Yeah, I know, he said slowly. But this doesn't strike me as the most welcoming place. Just relax and be yourself, Clint replied, clapping him on the shoulder. You'll be fine. They went inside, the sunlight bathing the interior as they opened the door. Several kerosene lanterns burned around, as well as a lone emergency light running off of a jury-rigged car battery in the corner. Cozy, Gad muttered. Shut up, Clint muttered back. Half a dozen bikers sat at the bar nursing drinks, 
They were all burly and clad head to toe in leather biker gear. A couple had beards, all of them had tattoos, and all of them turned and stared at the duo as they entered. The bartender was the lone female, a short blonde girl covered in the same tattoos. You sure you boys are in the right place? she asked as she swigged a whiskey, twirling a blade around the bar top. Depends, Clint drawled. Is this where the slayers hang out? She didn't respond, simply deferred to the biggest guy at the bar. He downed his drink and slammed down the glass, getting up and approaching them. I'm back, he said, raising his wide chin. Leader of the slayers, he crossed his arms, the leather straining against his gigantic shoulders. Now, what in the hell do you boys want? You're taking up valuable drinking time. I'm Clint, and this is Corporal Gad, Clint said, motioning between them. We're here to offer you a job. Buck blinked, and then looked back at his buddies, and everyone burst out laughing. Offer me a job, he boomed. Boy, do I look like I need, or hell, even want a job. The laughing continued for another moment before dying down. So, you interested or not? Clint asked. Hell no, I ain't interested in working for no military or government or whatever the fuck you boys are calling it, Buck snapped. We're doing just fine as we are. Sure, for now, Clint replied smoothly. But what happens in a few weeks when the alcohol runs dry? I'll tell you what happens. You'll be sitting here in the dark, wishing you had taken my offer seriously. Buck eyed him up and down. All right. You got some balls on you, boy, he drawled. Y'all come in and have a seat at the bar. Say your piece, and we'll consider it. Clint led Gad to the bar, and most of the men moved to make room. Gad ended up beside a gigantic man who looked like he could bench press a truck. He eyed him cautiously, and the man simply grunted back. Don't mind meat, Buck said, inclining his head to the man. He don't bite. You know damn well he bites, the bartender quipped. That's why his last girl left him. No my fault, Meat said gruffly. I gave her exactly what she asked for. She rolled her eyes. What can I get you boys to drink, she asked. Whiskey is fine for me, Clint replied. Oh, um, Gad stammered. I guess I'll have a whiskey too. She nodded. Coming right up, she said. Okay, Clint. Buck said, rolling his fingers in the air. Say your piece. Why are you here? Because we are in dire need of some men with your particular set of skills, Clint replied. Buck jutted out his chin. Oh, yeah? he asked, taking a sip of his freshly filled drink. And what kind of skills are those? The ability to be a badass in the face of danger, Clint said simply. Buck smirked and chuckled. That's a good description of what we do all right, he drawled. But not exactly flush with details there. We need scavengers, Gat piped up, his voice hoarse. Scavengers? Buck scoffed. Boy, you think we're buzzards or something? Clint shook his head. Not at all, he replied. We think you're a bunch of badasses who can survive outside the safe zone and find what we need. Well, we are certainly badasses, but what in the world are you boys looking for that's so damn important that you come up here bothering me and interrupting my buzz? Buck drawled. Clint flattened a hand down on the bar. Food, he said seriously. Buck was in the middle of taking a drink, but paused, setting the glass down. Food, he repeated. You need us to go out looking for food. Just how fucked up are things in that little safe zone of yours? Fucked up enough that coming and chatting with you is a viable option for us, Clint replied. Buck took a long drink and then slammed the glass down, running his tongue over his teeth. The bartender refilled it quickly, and he swelled the booze around as he glanced around at the other men in the room. Food, huh? he finally asked, turning back to Clint. 
So I'm guessing y'all ain't sending us down to the super center. The corporal shook his head. Nope, he said, clearing his throat. Out of communities that are pretty much untouched, so you can expect resistance, but also hopefully expect to find a few full pantries. And what's in it for us? Buck asked, clucking his tongue. We're taking all the risk, so surely you're paying well. First off, you get fuel for the mission, Clint said, holding up a finger. And not sure if you read the rumors, but we aren't going to have gas for quite some time. At least not for your bikes. So if you want to get out and ride, this is your only option. Buck shrugged and shook his head. Gonna need a bit more than that, he said. Riding is a luxury that we can live without. Clint cocked his head. Okay, I'll give you the two percent rule, he said with a shrug. What's that? Buck asked, cocking a brow. You get to keep two percent of whatever you bring back, Clint replied smoothly. Find a hundred pounds of food, you get two pounds for yourselves on top of your regular rations. Buck shook his head. Ten percent, he shot back. Five percent, Clint countered. And you'll thank me for it. If not, we can go to the next people on our list and ask them. Then you and your gang here can enjoy the winter months cooped up in this dank bar enjoying your 750-calorie salads. He stared him down, hoping he could see the seriousness in his look, even though he was taking a chance on bluffing. Okay, five percent, Buck finally conceded. Deal, Clint said. But just so we're clear, it's five percent of the same type of thing you bring back. No bringing back twenty pounds of food and four hundred pounds of bricks. Buck grinned. Fair enough, he said, and held up his glass, prompting everyone else to do the same, including Gad, who hadn't even touched his yet. Get ready, boys. We're going on a hunt. Everybody cheered and downed the drink, including the corporal, who immediately began coughing, prompting laughter. Meat slapped him on the back and laughed. I like this guy, he bellowed. Come, friend, let's have another. Gad looked at Clint with panic in his eyes, but the latter simply smirked and motioned for the bartender to refill his glass. Once everyone was refilled and she had her own, they all raised them again and downed them again, prompting more cheers and laughter. Clint and Gad felt warm, enjoying the brief reprieve from a desolate day. Chapter Seven. The sun was starting to get low on the day as Clint and Gad parked the car and got out. They were a little tipsy from being at the bar with their new friends, stumbling a bit as they got out. The line by the stadium was still just as long as it had been when they left. Either I'm seeing double, or they're still doing some pretty good business over there, Clint drawled. The corporal sighed. Bet they have another huge stack of potentials for us to go through, he said. Come on now, maybe they've been interviewing a bunch of nobodies today, Clint said, clapping him on the back. Could just be two or three potentials for us to interview. Noah emerged from the stadium, wheeling a pushcart full of document boxes on it. You were saying? Gad asked. Clint sighed. Remind me why we signed up for this job again. Where else are you going to get drunk with a bunch of bikers while working? The corporal asked. Clint held up a finger. You make a fair point there, bud, he said. Noah stopped in front of them, cocking a perfectly sculpted brow. Someone having a bit too much fun today? He asked. Just do not due diligence to get the job done, Gad said firmly. Clint put his hands on his hips. Yeah, what he said, he added. Don't suppose that due diligence has found me a briefcase, has it? Noah asked with a chuckle. I'll have you know that Clint here is a man of his word, Gad said, a little too loudly, and has put out feelers to several people so far today. Noah cocked his head. Any bites? he asked. Not yet, but I'm staying on top of it, Clint said, raising a victory fist. I appreciate it, Noah replied with a smirk. And I've been staying on top of my job as well. He smacked the top of the boxes. Lot of good potentials in here. Nice mix of skill sets. Clint leaned forward. Got anybody with construction or handyman backgrounds? He asked. 
Noah thought, tapping his chin. Probably not in the boxes, as those are more specialized, he said. What exactly are you looking for them to do? Need as many people as you can find who can assemble greenhouses. Stuff like that, Clint replied. Noah nodded slowly. Yeah, I know a few off the top of my head, he said. When do you need them by? Have them meet me out front of the stadium at dawn tomorrow, Clint replied. They're going to have a busy few weeks. Noah grinned. You got it, he said. Anything else? The duo exchanged a glance and then shrugged. I think we're good for tonight, Gad said. Noah nodded. You two have a great evening, he said and tossed them a wink. Don't work so hard. Trust me, that won't be an issue, Clint drawled as the chuckling man walked off. So, what do you say, bud? You feel like diving into these boxes to see what we got? Gad looked to the west as the sun lowered itself on the horizon. You good, Corporal? Clint asked softly. Yeah, Gad replied with a sigh. Just soaking in the moment. Trying to make it a point to do that more often. Clint smiled. Take all the time you need, he said, and watched the sunset. They stood there for a time as the sun dipped and once it grew dark, an engine started up in the distance. As it grew louder, external lights began to come on along the street. The men shifted their focus from nature's beauty to a man-made one. As long as I live, I will never take that sight for granted again, Clint said, basking in the electricity. You say that now, Gat warned. But when we're digging through those boxes at three in the morning, I bet you say different. Clint nodded and reached over, opening up his partner's messenger bag and pulling out a stack of papers. What are you looking for? the corporal asked. Hang on, hang on, Clint said as he sifted through the sheets. Finally, he smiled. Good, it's not that far away. What are you talking about? Gat demanded. Clint handed him the paper, and it was the census document on the baseball coach. It's too nice of an evening to already be cooped up in a room, he said. What do you say we go talk to one more tonight and get some batting practice scheduled? You know, if we do this, then we're going to be up all night, don't you? Gad asked. Clint shrugged. We're going to be up all night anyway, he said. Plus, it probably couldn't hurt to walk off some of that alcohol. Gad contemplated for a moment, before nodding in agreement. All right, you win, he said with a sigh. Let's go hunt down a baseball coach. They popped the trunk, tossing the boxes inside before starting their walk. Their day had been long, the first of many that would be just like this, or even harder. But, for the moment, they enjoyed a much-deserved stroll through a street-lit sliver of civilization. The End Up next, in an effort to get the fuel flowing again, a small group embarks on a dangerous mission to the Canadian oil fields in Seattle Rebuild, Part 2.